back to another episode of Medicine Health Podcast series where we bring you cutting edge medical conversations from the world of renowned experts. I'm Hetri Shah, your host, and today's topic is one that continues to challenge both patients and healthcare professionals, which is epilepsy. Epilepsy is a complex neurological disorder with wide-ranging effects and managing it effectively effectively can be life changing for many patients and to guide us through this i am honored to have with us today dr sudhir ambedkar a distinguished consultant neurosurgeon based in mumbai with over 9 years of experience in this field dr sudhir is known for his expertise in skull based surgery and neurointerventional surgery not only has he published over 85 articles and book chapters but he has also been awarded the prestigious fellowship of american association of neurological surgeons so doctor uh, welcome to the podcast and we are so excited to have you here thank you for having me here so doctor to kick things off could you share a bit about your professional journey and what led you to focus on neurosurgery and particularly on epilepsy okay thank you so uh, for me uh, it was more of a uh, coincidence that i landed up in neurosurgery i initially uh, did not have neurosurgery in mind i had so i knew that i wanted to do something in neurosciences but uh, specifically whether to go for neurosurgery or neurology dawned upon me when i visited uh, my alma mater that is uh, national institute of mental health and neurosciences in hans uh back in uh, 2006 so when i secured admission there and i i visited the hospital i looked at the various uh ways that neurosurgery can affect and can uh, better a person's life and it can mean i mean it does mean a matter of life and death uh, especially in neurosurgery so that changed my mind and uh, i uh, was completely focused towards neurosurgery from that on it is such a in the fascinating part doctor now coming to the next question so when it comes to epilepsy there are some cases that are very difficult to diagnose so in your experience what are the most challenging forms of epilepsy epilepsy to identify and how can healthcare professionals distinguish between epileptic and non epileptic seizures so the first thing the most important thing in epilepsy is to try to identify the focus of seizure the point in the brain where the seizure starts that is called the epileptogenic zone uh that is the focus that is the most challenging thing so in some patients the uh, the site of uh, epilepsy is seen on an mri or a pet scan or uh, on eeg that is the electroencephalogram however there is a subset of patients where they continue to have epilepsy but we do not see the focus on mri imaging or any other imaging modality as yet so this subset of patients is the most difficult to tackle because they are resistant to multiple medications at the same time we do not know what is the origin of epilepsy in them so they have uh, so in non lesional epilepsy where when there is no lesion seen on the imaging these are pe- people called non lesional epilepsy there are a number of uh, modalities or number of tests that we can do to try to identify the focus of seizure and treat it Uh, as uh, coming to the next question about how to differentiate between epileptic seizures and pseudo seizures so again the most important thing is clinical examination and witnessing the episode first hand either witness it in person or if the family member or anybody has recorded the seizure episode one can go through it there are a number of pointers subtle pointers which will lead us to understand whether someone is uh, suffering really from a epileptic seizure or a pseudo seizure for example giving you an example the seizures happen when uh, there is when the patient is in s- certain surroundings or surrounded by people only other people and the seizures do not happen when the person is alone 
that points towards the possibility of a pseudo seizure rather than a epileptic seizure wherein uh, epileptic seizure is involuntary and can occur even when the person is alone or with uh, in some company so similarly there are a number of such pointers which can help us differentiate between the two sometimes it can still be challenging to dis- differentiate between a pseudo seizure and a actual epileptic fit is that was really insightful and i think differentiating between these seizures also ensures that a patient receive the right care so now another uh, challenge in uh, epilepsy management is drug resistant uh, epilepsy so what is the current understanding of this condition and how do you approach these cases in terms of treatment options and prognosis okay so when we say drug resistant epilepsy one should understand that almost 80 to 90% of people who suffer from epilepsy uh, can be managed on medications either one two or three medications their uh, uh, seizures can be prevented on medications having said that about 10 to 20% of people with epilepsy do not Uh, have their seizures controlled with even with multiple medications the current definition of drug resistant epilepsy is any epilepsy which is resistant to at least two drugs can qualify for a drug resistant epilepsy so in drug resistant epilepsy one can either go for adding new other newer anti epileptic medications to try to control the epilepsy or now uh, evaluate for possibility of surgery for these patients and how do we evaluate the first step in management or evaluation for these seizure uh, patients for epilepsy surgery is to try to identify the focus of uh, this seizure there are a number of modalities such as mri mr imaging even in mr imaging just the routine mr imaging does not uh, yield the necessary answers sometimes so one needs to do a standardized epilepsy protocol mr imaging and followed by either a video eeg or a simple eeg sometimes we may need to do a neuropsychological assessment to try to identify the deficits and maybe the site of uh, the epilepsy sometimes we may need to do a pet scan to see or a spec scan to see uh, identify the site of epilepsy once the focus of uh, epilepsy the epileptogenic zone is identified one can then again then think about how to address it again there are a number of ways to address the epileptogenic zone it can range from simple uh, surgery wherein we resect that epileptogenic zone or we disconnect the pathways that transmit epileptic seizures and sometimes if they we use a radio frequency ablation technique to uh, uh, just uh, uh, ablate the epileptogenic zone and rarely one can also do what is called a vagus nerve stimulation wherein if the if there are multiple epileptogenic zones then one can implant a electrode in the uh, to stimulate the vagus nerve and to abort uh, seizures from happening Yes, I think that was so great to hear that there are so many evolving strategies also to manage this drug-resistant epilepsy. Now, um, managing epilepsy can be particularly complex in certain populations, like you know, children or pregnant women or even the elderly. So, uh, could you share some uh, insights into how treatment strategies differ across these groups and the special considerations healthcare professionals should keep in mind? so in children with epilepsy uh, important things to note that children are the, the brains of the children and the children are still developing uh, so uh, not controlling seizures in this age group can lead to can hinder the growth of these children again in children there are a number of uh, congenital anomalies of the brain such as hemimegalencephaly sturge weber syndrome all these syndromes rasmussen encephalitis all these can lead to epilepsy so apart from in in adults there are there is a it's a different subset of patients who have epilepsy but in children there could be congenital syndromes that can be associated with epilepsy there these epilepsies can cause uh, de- developmental delay in children 
they can lead to other uh, deficits also in children so one needs to keep that in mind and not wait for the developmental delay to happen so treating seizures in children is of utmost importance and one should not uh, withhold or one should not be quiet without controlling seizures uh, most common form of epilepsy in children is the uh, febrile seizures wherein up to 5 years of age uh, high fever can itself uh, trigger seizures in these children so some form like these febrile seizures are relatively benign entities and the uh, children can become seizure free uh, as they grow later in life again surgery is a important aspect of treatment in uh, children also with drug resistant epilepsy or in syndromic epilepsy such as Rasmussen encephalitis, Sturge Weber syndrome, tuberous sclerosis complex, wherein surgery can play a pivotal role in controlling epilepsy and promoting developmental delay. Coming to pregnant women, uh, seizures in pregnant seizures are not a contraindication to pregnancy. Epilepsy is not a contraindication to pregnancy. One needs to be careful because some of the anti-epileptics or most of the anti-epileptic medications can be teratogenic. They can cause fetal anomalies if uh, they, uh, uh, the women are continuing to take it at the time of conception, especially in the first trimester. So in pregnant women with epilepsy, if someone is planning for a, a child, then one needs to consult the doctor, neurologist or uh, the gynecologist and change the medications such that uh, the medications that do not cause harm or cause least uh, risk of uh, congenital anomalies are uh, taken. Uh, also, one needs to start with folic acid and iron before even conception so that the risk of congenital anomalies is reduced as much as possible. Levetiracetam is found to be a very safe medication in pregnant women and uh, many pregnant women uh, continue our transition to levetiracetam or levetiracetam can be continued throughout the entire period of pregnancy and postpartum period uh, with uh, without any significant risk of congenital anomalies coming to elderly again just like in children elderly people also have a number of issues that can lead to seizures not just uh, the uh, primary brain anomalies per se elderly people have multiple comorbidities so any metabolic causes such as uh, any acid base disorders or electrolyte disturbances they can lead to seizures so one needs to keep that in mind infectious causes in elderly can lead to seizures so elderly people have a slightly different etiology of for seizures as compared to younger people and children yes i think also it has each group has Uh, one more question is like these days uh, epilepsy in children is increasing i believe so what are in your experience what are some particular uh, factors that are affecting that so uh, i think some of the factors that affect uh, increase in the uh, incidence of epilepsy in children are one is uh, nowadays uh, uh, the children are being born or the women are getting pregnant at a later age so beyond 35 or 40 years of age again the risk of congenital anomalies increases mm -hmm. whenever there is uh, uh, so these are some of the factors also uh, earlier many of these children the perinatal mortality rate infant mortality rate was very high so now that the infant mortality rate and perinatal mortality rate has reduced significantly so these children who earlier used to not survive beyond a few days or a year are now surviving and maybe they are going on to develop seizures in their later period. Having said that, as such, the risk of the, the incidence of epilepsy has not significantly increased. It's just that it, it is being recognized more often and there is slightly a transition that children are being born at a, a increasing age. So that again puts the children at risk of developing congenital anomalies and indirectly seizures.
yeah that now makes a lot of sense very clear now you know epilepsy often exists with other conditions like anxiety depression or even cognitive uh, dysfunction so how do you approach the management of epilepsy when these comorbidities are present and how do they influence the overall prognosis and quality of life of patients so very often uh, associated uh, developmental delay and other congenital so epilepsy itself is a seizure so one needs to control the seizures for sure again it depends on what are the associated congenital anomalies or syndromes that are associated with epilepsy and what is the natural history of these people such as uh, especially like in rasputin's encephalitis tuberous sclerosis hemimegalencephaly or any other uh, uh, sturge weber syndrome epilepsy is only a part of the syndrome and so other numerous genetic anomalies epilepsy is only a part of the syndrome and the actual syndrome itself can lead to developmental delay and other things so one needs to try to treat whatever is a treatable uh, cause uh, control the seizures and uh, give the best chance for child to develop but if there are associated genetic anomalies which do not have any treatment then uh, probably our goal should be to just uh, control the epilepsy and uh, help with therapy and uh, uh, behavioral therapy and cognitive therapy of the child yeah so it is uh, more than just controlling uh, seizures as well sometimes right right so now as we wrap up today's session thank you so much doctor for sharing your deep insights with us today thank you Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And epilepsy management is a challenging field, but it is clear that with the experts like you at the forefront, patients have a better chance at living fuller lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning into this episode of Mix and Match podcast series. And remember, if you're a healthcare professional who is eager to delve deeper into medical topics or have questions, do not hesitate to join us on the Synapse platform. The Synapse platform is not just a resource; it's a dynamic space where you can connect with your medical peers, participate in meaningful discussions, and contribute to the ongoing evolution of healthcare. So, until next time, stay informed and stay inspired.